I am on a mission that will take the rest of my life to successfully accomplish. And it's a mission that says, I want you to understand how valuable your life is. When God created you, he did so on purpose, with purpose, and for purpose. He's got a plan for your life. What does the enemy know about your life? That he's desperately trying to stop you from ever getting there. There is a plan for your life that you and only you can accomplish it the way God created it to be accomplished. You've got to understand your value. You have to understand your purpose. You have to understand the two words that I always share wherever I speak, that you matter. Hi, everyone, I'm Dean Sykes. You know, since January 1st, 1993, I've been speaking with teenagers. And if you're a teenager watching this today, I am going to talk from my heart to yours. You'll notice I don't have any notes. I never, you know, I've spoken at over 3,400 schools. So I've never read a speech, and I'm not going to start today. Today, I just want to talk to you about your life. And I'm going to share some of my life with you and see how those two, those two stories kind of connect. I want you to, if you'll do me a favor, I don't want you to just listen to me with your ears. I want you to hear me with your heart. I want you to really kind of just buckle in and just get with me because you're going to see pretty quickly that I'm not going to talk with you as teenagers. To be honest with you, I, I just don't have the time. I'm going to talk with you as young adults who have the ability and the opportunity to really make some serious choices. And one of the things you're going to hear me say a lot today in our time together is this, your choices create your circumstances. If you today do not like the, the circumstances of your life, check your choices. This is real simple. Good choices equal good circumstances. Not so good choices equal not so good circumstances. And you know what? You know why I talk with teenagers? People in, in the business world ask me all the time. They go, Dean, why don't you invest your time speaking in corporate America? Let me tell you why. First of all, this is my calling. This is what I believe I'm called to do. Secondly, I can relate to you. I understand. Even, even though there are years and <laughs> decades between you and me, the reality is I still understand what it's like to be you sitting where you're sitting today watching this. In my life, I went through some things that were pretty traumatic. And I imagine you may have gone through some things in your life that were pretty traumatic for you. How do you deal with it? You know, one of the things that I've learned in, in all of this, this the journey we call life is this. If you and I do not deal with our emotions, our emotions will deal with us. They don't just go away some magical way like, well, one day you wake up, everything's fine. No, this takes work. This takes faith. This takes you and, and, and you and I together understanding that every decision we make leads us down this journey. And again, I'm not going to talk with you as teenagers. I think that would be almost insulting to you. I mean, it would be almost arrogant of me to come to you and, 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 and say to you, hey, I know what it's like to be who you are. I don't know exactly what it's like to be you because I'm not you, but I know what it's like to live a life that is... Well, it's, it's, it's been challenging at, at times. <laughs> Let me tell you some of the story. When I, was, um, when I was 15 years old, let's just start there. When I was 15, I was sexually abused. Now look deep into my blue eyes and hear what I just said. I was sexually abused. 60 seconds changed my life. It was a Wednesday afternoon. I vividly remember being at school and I was so excited because, I mean, I wasn't a big fan of school. I always enjoyed, you know, getting out of school and going and doing things. I loved to play tennis. I mean, I did a lot. Of, I, I was a very active individual. And I remember this particular Wednesday, a buddy of mine and I were going to go play um, sports at his home before church started. And I was, it was a Wednesday because I was going to church that night. So my, my life was just, it was, you know, it was, that day was a very fast paced day. And I remember that a friend of mine was going to pick me up had a brand new sports car. We were going to drive up about 25 minutes to, to, to this, this friend's home. And we did that. And I remember that this friend of mine had been given this, this game. And it, it got my attention. And when we went to the bedroom where the game was, I remember the door shutting. And I thought, that's, that's weird. But at 15 years old, I mean, I must have been pretty naive, I guess. But then something happened, and it radically changed the course of my life. I say it this way, 60 seconds changed my life. This is why I can say to teenagers, wherever you are on this spectrum of life, emotions are real. People ask me all the time, well, why do bad things happen to good people? That's a subject we'll get into, but 
maybe by the time we're finished with this assembly today. When the abuse was over, I had literally lost my voice. I couldn't say anything. I had no voice. I felt betrayed. I felt angry. I felt damaged. I felt ugly. I mean, my, it, in 60 seconds, my entire world shifted, literally. And here's where my story takes a, a, um, takes a turn, if you will. I made the decision that I was not going to tell anyone what happened to me. And for 22 years, I never told anyone what had happened. I buried it. I buried it so deep that I became an angry individual. Why? Hurting people hurt people. I was angry. I was hurting. And, and, and what I didn't understand at 15 and 16 years old was why suddenly were all these older girls so attracted to me? Why were they wanting to go out and have dates and have fun? And why? why? And I began to understand why, because they had been damaged. What, is this, what does this have to do with you? Guess what? Healthy attracts healthy. Unhealthy attracts unhealthy. And I was very unhealthy. By the time I was 17 years old, two years into this journey of having been abused, not telling anyone what had happened to me, at 17 years old, I failed P.E. in high school. <laughs> it's okay to laugh. How do you fail P.E.? That was, that was the question my dad asked. Dean, how, how do you fail the easiest class you'll ever take? Well, I made a decision. Again, remember what I said when we first began, choices create circumstances. I made the decision that I was not going to put myself in a, in a place where I had to change clothes. Now, keeping in mind, at 17, I played quarterback, I taught tennis, and I played golf. I was pretty athletic. But I was also so wounded on the inside, there was no way I was ever going to let anybody put me in that position again. And so at 17, my coach in PE said, Dean, if you don't dress out, I will fail you. I was the poster child for arrogance and stupidity. And I thought to myself, you won't fail me. Because also at 17 years old, I was the youngest political consultant in the state of Tennessee where I live. I had TV cameras wherever I went. I had photographers. I had reporters asking me questions. Because Not because I was such a great strategist. I was the youngest guy doing it. And so I was looking at this coach going, man, I was in the front page of the paper Sunday. You're not going to give me an F in P.E.? Well, when our report cards came out, I had algebra, English, history, civics, and what? P.E. And next to P.E., there was this F. I marched myself into his office, the coach's office. I said, coach. He said, Dean, I told you, if you didn't pay the price and dress out, I was going to fail you. I said, coach, where I went to school, our parents had to sign her report cards. That can be a life-changing experience. I said, coach, I can't take an F home. I'll do anything. I'll go, out to the, I'll go outside. I'll go up and down those, those, those bleachers. I'll do sit-ups, push-ups. I'll, I'll run the track. Whatever you want me to do. He said, I'll tell you what, come back tomorrow morning. We'll start all over, fresh slate. I said, great. I said, now, about this report card. He went, oh, no, no. That's your F. You earned it. Have your dad sign your report card. Leaving me standing in that coach's office as he walked past me, and I was thinking, God, this would be a great moment for the rapture to occur. But no trumpet blasted, and we were still there, and I went home. Now, at this point in my life, because I was, again, damaged, and when I looked in the mirror, I didn't like me, so how could I possibly conceivably believe that you would like me? I went home, and I did what I always did at that point in my life. I lied. I tried to tell a lie to my parents. My dad looked at me and said, Dean, there's, there's no way. You, everything looks great on your report card. And I thought, God, you've blinded my dad. He doesn't see the F. Just sign it. I'm out of here. He said, but wait a minute. When he said, wait a minute, I knew. He said, Dean, there's no way to fail PE. And I said, Dad, there's a way to fail PE. He said, are you telling me you failed the easiest class you will ever take? I said, yes, sir. He said, do you want to talk about it? I said, no, sir. <laughs> that was honest. He said, let's talk about it. I said, yes, sir. And from that one conversation with my dad, here's what I learned. I never again failed PE, but the more important lesson that I learned that I've shared from here to, you know, I don't know, South Africa, Russia, Australia, all over America, and now today here with you. If you and I do not pay the price, we will pay a price. There are no free lunches. Every single decision that you make carries with it a benefit or a consequence. And, in the, and listen, in the, the day in which we're living, it is so terribly competitive out there in the real world past the four walls of wherever you are right now, it's so competitive out there, you've got to understand your value. You have to understand your purpose. You have to understand the two words that I always share wherever I speak, that you matter. It's critically important. Because you see, if, if you don't believe that you matter, no one else is going to, why would someone else believe that? 
you've got to carry within you the ability, the, the, the knowing that you were created on purpose, with purpose, and for purpose. You are not a mistake. Well, let's keep going. I got through school, <laughs> didn't enjoy I was working in politics. I was bouncing all over the state, working in campaigns. Again, the media attention was intense. Dating great looking girls. You know, had some money. Had this stuff. Eh, to be honest with you, this stuff had me. I went to church every time the doors were open. My friends were Christians. I'd gone to Christian schools. And yet, to be honest, I would not have known God from Adam. Well, you go, well, I don't want to talk about God. Oh, that's fine. You do what you want to do. But for me, here's where my life changed. 21 years old. I'm now working in real estate development. Our company had two airplanes. Listen, this was my world. I could call my girlfriend. I'd be in Florida checking on a shopping center. I'd say, hey, I'm, I'm going to be in Chattanooga in 65 minutes. That's 700 miles. Let's go to New York tonight. We'd hop on the jet. That, that, that was what I did. I had the world by the tail. Listen, best-selling book of all time says you can, you can gain the whole world, but if you lose your soul, what's really important, you're in trouble. So I'm, I'm, I'm working in real estate development. I'm out of politics now. I'm, I'm, I'm moving forward in life. L things are happening. Maybe like some of you, you, you know, think life's happening. Things, good things are happening. But on the inside, there's this internal weight that just keeps weighing on me, and I can't shake it. And I'm trying to figure out, why am I not happy? The jet, I mean, I'm 10,000 feet vertical in 60 seconds. Why does, that ex why does that not excite me anymore? I mean, the girls I'm dating, my, my dear God in heaven, they're, they're gorgeous. Why? No, doesn't matter. The money I may have, didn't matter. Nothing satisfied me. You ever been so dissatisfied that you just don't know what to do? I meet so many teenagers who come up to me after an assembly and they say, can I just tell you my story? And any time a teenager says that, man, I just, I just park it and I go, talk, I want to hear. I want to hear what's coming out of you, what's going on in your life. And, then, and they're so gracious. They just, they, they just start talking and they listen. And, and then I, as, as they're listening to me respond to them together, we're having this dialogue. And the whole time I'm thinking, going, man, I just want you to get it. Because you understand, this, this is important. Every day in America, 5,400 teenagers attempt suicide. Don't miss what I just said. Every day in America, 5,400 teenagers attempt suicide. In an arena that seats 12,000 people, that arena would fill up every two and a half days with teenagers who in the previous 60 hours had bought the lie. Maybe you can relate. When I was 21, everything in my life changed. And I'm just going to tell you what happened. Believe it, don't believe it. It's what? Your choice. There's that word again, right? We keep hearing that word choice. 21 years old, I prayed to a God I didn't know. And I said these words, I don't think you're real. I don't think you hear me. And I feel stupid talking to the wind. But if I'm wrong, and if you are real, and if you've got something that you want me to do that will bring purpose into my life, then would you just show up in my life and let me know it? And then I said these two words, prove it. <laughs> don't ever under any circumstances ask God, the creator of the universe, to prove to you that he's real unless you're ready for an encounter of the first kind. Two weeks come and go. I forget that I even prayed. There was no faith in my prayer. I just forget it. I mean, I, that's, I just prayed it and that was it. Two weeks come and go. It's now March. I'm 21 years old. It's a windy day. The sun was shining so bright. I'll, I'll never forget this day. As I, as I walked into my office after lunch, it was a little, I'd taken a little later than usual lunch. As I walked into my office, I said hello to Sharon, our receptionist. I walked down a hall. I turned right into my office, shut my door. I'm dialing a phone. I'm calling, a, I'm calling the check on a shopping center we had just built in Beckley, West Virginia. As I'm dialing this phone, behind me, off to my left, I hear someone say, call mom. It, I mean, I turned. I went, who's in my office? I saw no one there, but I had just heard, call mom. I heard that same voice 14 years earlier when I was seven years old when someone at my grandparents' home said, Dean, and I went to my grandfather and I said, did you call me? He said, no, sir, I didn't call you. I went to my dad, did you call? No. I went to my mom. She says, Dean, go back and sit down and listen for that voice again. So at 21, I hear these words, call mom. I see no one, but in, in here, I know 
dial the number. I dial 344-7443. The phone rings six times, seven times. On the eighth ring, my mother answers the telephone, and when she said hello, instantaneously I knew something was terribly wrong. For in that moment in time, when I hear the words, call mom, spoken to me by the Spirit of God, believe it, don't believe it, that's what happened. My mother at that precise instant was attempting suicide. She was dying. It doesn't matter to me if she's your best friend, your worst enemy. Somebody you see three times a day or three times a year. If you're here and 25 minutes away on the other end of the telephone line, the lady who gave birth to you is literally dying. That's going to change your life. I call it a defining moment. And every single one of you watching this right now, you will at some point in your life, if you have not yet had it, maybe you will have it today or it will happen somewhere in the future. You will have this thing called a defining moment. And that will be a timestamp moment in your life where everything changes. Does it have to be tragic? No. It might be something just absolutely spectacular, but there will be a moment where everything changes. I bolted out of my office, went past Sharon, the receptionist, jumped into my car, drove up Interstate 75, talked to this God I didn't know and said, save my mom, I can't. I drove into my parents' neighborhood. From the outside in, their home looked fine. It was safe, secure, probably like where you live, but from the inside out, my mom was dying. I see hundreds of thousands of people, teenagers, each year. I mean, hundreds of thousands, we see them. Whether it's like this, whether it's in live assemblies, whether it's on social media, we connect. And from the outside in, everything looks fine. But from the inside out, I wonder what's really going on with you. Who are you hanging out with? What are the choices that you're making? Do you have a vision for your life? Do you have a plan for your life? Do you know the difference between vision and goal? I mean, all these things are so critically important. I remember I got to my mom and dad's home. I ran out of my car, went to their front door, beat on the front door. My mom at that point was barely alive. She came down some stairs. She fell into my arms. I picked her up. I carried her to her car, and I drove her to a place called Park Ridge Hospital in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And as we drove, she looked at me, and she said this one sentence, Dean, I can't be dying. And I said, Mom, hang on. You're not going to die, but you're going to have to watch this. Choose to live. Best-selling book of all time says it this way. Choose you this day who you're going to serve. I remember a doctor at the emergency room threw me against the wall. They rushed mom into the emergency room area and they began to work with her. 45 minutes later, the same ER doc walks over to my dad, has the most bewildered look on his face. And he says this sentence, Mr. Sykes, there is no medical reason whatsoever to tell you what I'm getting ready to tell you. It is a quote, miracle of God. Your, your wife is fine. You can go see her. And I stood there listening to this doctor who had four years of college, four years of med school, probably two or three years of uh, some, an internship somewhere residency. And he's, his answer to why my mom was alive is that it's a miracle of God. My dad said, you want to go see mom? I said, no, dad, I think I'm just gonna take a walk. And I could take you to the spot right now at Park Ridge Hospital, where I leaned against this wall, this long corridor of the hospital. And suddenly my life was beginning to change because I began to deal with me in that moment, that defining moment, that breaking moment, My life began to be no longer about me and what I wanted, when I wanted, with whomever I wanted, where I wanted, how I wanted. I took I out of the equation. And maybe today, maybe just maybe some of you might want to consider taking I out of the equation. And I began to look to see what was my real purpose. I realized pretty quickly it wasn't politics. Then I realized it wasn't going to be in building shopping centers that didn't fulfill me. Suddenly I had this great desire to help people. I just wanted somebody to know that their life mattered. And that began me on a journey of just traveling and talking to literally millions of teenagers from all walks of life. I remember talking when I was in South Africa and outside when it was it was 106 degrees outside. And there were, you know, I don't know, over a thousand kids standing there and they were hanging on to every syllable coming out of my mouth. Not because I was such a great speaker. They were so hungry for the intangible asset of hope that we bring. I remember being in a Luther down in the Bahamas. And when I got through speaking, they, they put me in a car and I drove. They were heading to the airport. I looked in my rearview mirror and students were running after our car. They wanted more. I remember being in Russia and having a translator and and just, you know, doing what we're called to do and, and seeing lives just change right before our very before my very eyes thinking, wow, how rewarding. One of the things that I, that I often share with students is when I get through speaking at an assembly or whatever, teenagers always will come up. They want to talk. They want to share their story with me. I was recently in 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 North Carolina. 
And a young man walked up to him and he had, the, he had this look on his face. There was, there was just basically nothing there. He just very, very non-emotional. And he said, uh, I liked what you said. And I said, thanks. I introduced myself. He told me his name. He said, uh, you really think my life matters? I said, yeah, man, I know your life matters. He said, can I give you something? Sure. And he handed me a lighter. And I said, man, I don't smoke. He goes, I don't either. And I go, why are you handing me a lighter? And I wasn't ready for his response. He said, oh, that's what I use to burn myself. Because I didn't think my life mattered. But you told me that it does. So I want you to take this. And I want you to show other students that they can do it too. And now I have a bag full. I'll never forget the young lady in Texas who walked up to me afterwards and she waited until everybody had left our product table. And it wasn't that she wanted to talk. It was that she needed to be heard. Big difference. So I went over to her and I said, hi, I'm Dean. She said, hi, I'm Megan. I said, I have a daughter named Megan. We call her Maggie. She said, that's nice. You can call me Megan. I said, Time out. Megan's it. She said, uh, can I talk to you? I said, sure, let's talk. I said, first of all, how old are you? She said, 14. That's an important part of the story. She began to tell me some of her, her life, and I began to just listen. Tears filled my eyes because I just, at 14, and she should, be, she should not have experienced what she was telling me she had experienced. She says, can I, uh, can I show you something on my arm? Yeah. And I noticed she had a sweater on, and she pulled her sleeve back, and she had just sliced her arm. It was horrible. I said, Megan, why would you do that? And the answer she gave me is the answer every single teenager without fail has given me this exact same answer. She said, Dean, I hurt myself to stop the pain. I hurt myself to stop the pain. And when she said that, I just stood there and I was kind of frozen in time thinking, I don't know what to say to this kid. And then she said to me, can I give you something? So we've gone from, hi, my name is Megan. Can I tell you my story? Can I show you my arm? Now she's trusting me more because why? I'm just listening. I'm just listening. And maybe if you and I ever got to connect, maybe I can just sit and just listen to you because maybe, maybe, just maybe you have, you have something you need to share. She reached into her bag and she pulled out a razor blade that was blood stained with her blood. And she said to me, I don't want to hurt myself anymore. Can I give this to you? I'll never forget that young lady named Megan. I'll never forget. In fact, I still have the razor blade. It's a constant reminder to me of why we do what we do. I share all of this today with you to, to get to this point. Your life really does matter. Helen Keller was asked this question. She was, they, were, they said, is there anything worse in your life than, than being blind? And her immediate response was yes. They said, what, death? She said, oh, no, no, no. I got death figured out. They said, what then is worse than you being blind? And her answer separates teenagers from young adults. Let's see where you are. She said, the one thing worse in my life than my being blind is the morning that I wake up and I realize for the very first time that I have no vision. A blind person cannot see, but a person with no vision has no idea where he or she is going. And today, that's what this is all about, getting you to understand that your life does matter. There is a purpose for your life. There is a vision waiting for you to discover it. You see, your vision, this is critically important. Your vision, my vision, is not ours to decide. It's ours to discover. And that is a journey in and of itself. I'll close with this. In March of 2020, my mom died. I was in the room when she went to heaven. And she and I had a relationship that had some ups and downs, probably like you and your parents. And I, and I stood there and I, and I watched her take her last breath here on this earth. And I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to respond. I wasn't sure how to feel. I knew where she was. If she wasn't lost, I, I knew that she, she had made a decision in her life and I knew that she had, had gone to a much better place. But yet there still within me left this void of now what? And that void of now what I have, I have seen on so many faces of young people. And so today what I want you to see from my heart to yours is simply this. There's a plan for your life. And maybe like you, like me, you've gone through some things that have been challenging. I mean, if we had time today, I could take you on so many journeys of things that have happened and so many people whom I have met who's just shared, who they've shared their stories with me. I mean, it, it would be an amazing adventure. But because of time, let's just get to this. I want you to understand that your life matters. One of the ways that I, I ask teenagers to acknowledge that their lives matter is by signing your name. 
because I'm not there with you right now, there's no way that I can hand you this piece of paper. This, we hand these out in assemblies when I'm actually in schools. But you can sign your name electronically on our website or on our app. What am I asking you to sign? It's a pledge. Why am I asking you to sign it? The older you get, the better you'll understand what I'm getting ready to say. Every single time you sign your name to something, you're taking responsibility for it. You go to dinner, you sign your name to a credit card. You buy a car, you sign your name. You buy, you open, you buy a house, you'll sign your name. Whatever it is, you, when you sign your name, you're saying, I take responsibility. This is mine. Bring this home. It's your life. You only get to live it once here. You're not a mistake. When God created you, he did not go, oops, look what I've just done. No. You were created on purpose, with purpose, for purpose. And because of that, I'm on a, I am on a mission that will take the rest of my life to successfully accomplish. And it's a mission that says, I want you to understand how valuable your life is. This is a pledge. It's called the I Matter Pledge. And it says this, I choose to live and not end my life for three reasons. I was created as an original for purpose and for relationship. If you go to our website, you'll see it on the screen. Go to our app, you'll see it on the screen. You can sign this right now. And I'm going to invite you to do that. Tens of thousands of young people have already signed this. I was somewhere speaking not long ago. And a young man walked up to me, and apparently I'd been at his school when he was in the ninth grade, and he was now a senior. Well, I didn't know him, of course, and I didn't remember being in his school, but he said to me, that pledge card? I said, yeah. He said, it saved my life. I said, how so? Tell me, that. I love to hear stories. He, he told me his story. He said, you know, because when, you swing, when I'm in school and students sign their, their name here, they tear this portion off, they give me the bottom portion, you keep the top. He said, that bottom portion? He said, I gave it to you. I said, yeah, I'm sure you did. But the top portion, I said, yeah. He said, it's in my bedroom, on my mirror, and I look at it every morning in my life, and I read it. I remind myself that I was created on purpose, with purpose, and for purpose. On the back of the pledge card or on the app or on the website, you'll see ways you can connect with us through social media. You'll see ways that, you know, what do you do now? I've signed this card. I'm having a challenge. What do I do? There's four steps you can take. None of this costs you anything. If you're interested in resources, I've written 29 books so far. Many of them are on our app. They don't cost you a dime. Just go to the app. Download it. Look, at, look for resources. And you'll see a bunch of free stuff. You'll see videos we've shot literally from, literally from South Africa to, to San Francisco to Ground Zero at New York City. All of which are there for you. I'm not asking you to do anything except invest in yourself. It doesn't cost you a dime to invest in yourself. It costs you some time. Thanks for letting me be a part of your life today. God bless you.